Last week, I covered adding horror to your dungeons, and it got me thinking about how to incorporate, you know, scary places into some of the other storylines and encounters of your campaign. And for me, one of the scariest places is a graveyard. Because the dead are interred there, it you know kind of infuses our fear of death, but also a sense of sort of dread and desolation. The dead are silent watchers, except, of course, in the world of D&D, where often the dead find no peace. And as such, unlike the brooding silence of a real-world graveyard, those of a homebrewed D&D campaign can be a place where Anything can happen. Hello again, folks. K.R. King here, helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. And today's topic, using graveyards, is more than just a primer on, you know, incorporating undead or ghosts into your campaign. Because when you consider the role that graveyards place in all societies in which the sentient creatures are not immortal, which is pretty much all of them, you realize that there's tons of opportunities to expand the kind of encounters that players have in a graveyard to reflect that status within a society. And the thing is, in the world of D&D, ghosts actually exist. And I know there's people out there writing, hey, listen, I believe in ghosts, or I've had this experience with ghosts, and you know what? You know, I love a good ghost story, too. But, you know, it's estimated that a hundred billion human beings have died in the past 50,000 years. And so if there were ghosts, you know, we'd see them all the time, on a regular basis. And you're going to say, oh, no, no, you know, ghosts use stealth. You know, the nature of them is to only be glimpsed briefly, and, you know, that's fine. So let's put it this way. The modern developed world does not make, you know, allowances or considerations, you know, for the actuality of ghosts. In other words, you can't say, the devil made me do it. But in the world of D&D, you can. Because ghosts and undead are real. And graveyards become a place where the domains of the living and the dead kind of find a nexus point. And so allowances must be made for this in the society of the world you create for your campaign. So the first kind of criterion I use to sort of account for this actuality in the world of D&D is to divide graveyards uh, between those that are sanctified and those that are unsanctified. Because in the real medieval world of Europe, at least, uh, people were divided in terms of the cemeteries they were buried in. You know, criminals and apostates and whatnot were in unsanctified cemeteries. You know, both to separate them from the upright citizens, but also to reflect, you know, the curse upon them when they go to the next world. You know, the bodies would have their heads or their feet cut off and they'd be buried upside down. But in D&D, this sanctification should reflect, you know, the power of the gods and divine magic. So a graveyard sanctified by a powerful, lawful god, let's say Palor, should be safe from infestations of undead, you know, ghosts and whatnot. And unlike the real medieval world of Europe, in which basically you either had Christian sanctified graveyards or pagan or unbeliever, you know, criminal unsanctified graveyards, in D&D you have a host of gods, both good and evil, who sanctify their burial grounds, such that the only ones that are unsanctified are those that are, you know, long forgotten uh, or whose gods have either abandoned them, you know, or disappeared into the mists of time. And what the power of sanctification does is allow you to have graveyards, you know, in towns and cities without having them be these sources for all sorts of nasty creatures. Unless the power of that god wanes, or you have, you know, NPCs, monsters, or player characters who enter a graveyard with the power to thwart it. So I'm always remembering this power of sanctification when I am thinking about and creating a graveyard. And then I use a template to let me think about the, you know, why and what of this gravesite. And these include the history of the graveyard, its location, who's buried there, what sort of graves does it contain, and its current condition. And as always with my templates, you know, all of these categories can interact with one another, you know, one to another to the next, so that you can have all sorts of different combinations. That gives them, you know, variety and provides logical impetus for all sorts of, you know, storylines and encounters in the different types of graveyards that you can come up with. All right, so the first consideration is the history of the graveyard. And of course, as is my want, I have another template that I use. You have a forgotten graveyard, an ancient one, 
one that is of recent history, and a contemporary graveyard that's still in use. You know, and by forgotten, I don't mean just you know, it's unknown. No one's ever seen or heard of it, and the players stumble across it. What I mean is, at this point, no one knows, you know, who created the graveyard and who is interred there, but people may be familiar with it. And so typically this graveyard is going to be of the distant past with no connection uh, to any of these sentient races, but not always. Because you could have, you know, let's say, travelers from some other plane or planet or something who arrive, you know, on the material plane and several members, you know, die or something. And there's their tradition, wherever they die, they bury them here. Uh, and then they go back to their plane. Well, now this is going to be a totally foreign and alien gravesite, maybe not even recognized as such. And if it's a forgotten graveyard from a distant past, it may have lost that power of sanctification uh, because these may be forgotten gods, gods of another plane. But, you know, you could have some, you know, evil god or demigod that comes across this burial site, recognizes, you know, the po inherent power of this connection nexus point between the realm of the living and the dead, and sort of reanimate this force. And you have an ancient graveyard, but it is recognized as such. Even though it is from the distant past, you know, player characters or other knowledgeable people in your world, you know, would recognize, oh, this is a, you know, this civilization or this race, it's a burial site. You know, you might have burial mounds, which, you know, educated people recognize as such, and they either avoid this area, you know, or perhaps seek it out to see what's there. And this can be risky because even though, as I said, the power of sanctification, if these are gods whose influence has waned, the act of digging up or disturbing these graves could revive it somewhat, and these, you know, ancient unknown gods could be looking for new adherents. So a graveyard from the recent past kind of depends on the, you know, age of uh, the civilization in your continent. Let's say a frontier continent, there's only been people on it for a hundred years, you know, all of the graveyards are going to be of the recent past. But usually from the recent past, we think of graveyards that were in use for a while or abandoned. So in the United States, you have all sorts of graveyards from the 19th century uh, that are no longer in use. I grew up in town in Rochester. There was Brewster Cemetery. Uh, the earliest uh, graves were from 1840. The last one was from 1904. Uh, and basically what happened was the congregation... Uh, people moved away, they no longer attended the church that supported it, and it became a historical site run by the state. But, you know, I always noticed the gravestones had names uh, that were reflected in, you know, roads and place names in my town. And this is the thing about something from the recent history. There is going to be a connection to the local area uh, where this, you know, no longer in use graveyard exists. And, you know, you would say perhaps it is still sanctified, uh, because of this recent history, but the question begs itself, well, why was it abandoned? But, you know, was it just the congregation people left or moved away, or did something happen? A plague or a curse or some infestation of creatures which drove people away. And they had to leave quickly and leave their dead behind. All right, which brings us to contemporary graveyards, those that are still in use and very familiar to everyone who lives in the area. And obviously, a contemporary cemetery is almost always still in use. And, you know, it reflects the values in terms of sanctification of the community in which it exists. But, you know, and a contemporary graveyard is a good source for encounters. Let's say the players discover, uh, you know, a secret graveyard run by an evil cult and there's some mission to destroy it, or you have a, you know, evil force that's looking to corrupt a contemporary graveyard. And as always, there can be things of great value uh, hidden in a contemporary graveyard <laughs> or a mausoleum that the players are interested in. All right, so remember that I mentioned these categories interact with each other. So let's go to location. So what I'm using here uh, is the template of remote, isolated, underground, and those in a settled area. So using the first lift, you'd think that a forgotten cemetery would either be in a very remote or isolated location. But, you know, you could have catacombs underneath a city that long sealed and forgotten about. You know, or a barely visible gravesite on a farm that's sort of hiding in plain sight. You know, you could have a very remote cemetery that is, you know, actively used. Think of like the Skellig Islands that were used in the Star Wars movie. You have a monastery there or something, they're going to continue to use the cemetery. It's just very difficult to get to. You know, you might associate an isolated uh, graveyard. Let's say it's in the center of some vast desert. You know, it's being forgotten, but no, it could be in an oasis used by the community that lives there. And you might think, well, a graveyard that's at the center of a big city obviously is going to be contemporary and be, you know, pristine or whatever, but it could be forgotten or it could be sealed, you know, with walls or something, you know, a cursed cemetery. All right, then you have the size of the cemetery, which really kind of often relates to its usage. So here I'm saying that you can have a single grave, 
less than 25 plots, 26 to 100 plots, and then 100 on up to as large as you can imagine. And let's face it, coming across a single gravestone in the middle of nowhere is creepy. But you know, you could have a family plot on the grounds of a castle or keep that has a single mausoleum, uh, or maybe it has little wooden markers where the servants are buried. Another thing is a, you know, private catacombs with graves underneath the castle. You know, a community graveyard is going to have the number of internees that, based on the size of whether it's a village, town, or city. You know, and some large city could have just some vast cemetery with hundreds of plots. So when you're thinking of the size of the cemetery, it lends itself well to certain categories. You know, a forgotten or lost cemetery, you think of these usually as rather small. Unless you have some very isolated area where once a vast city uh, now lost to the ravages of time and there you might have a huge, you know, forgotten cemetery. The other element with size is, you know, encounter design. If you have a, you know, single plot or only a few graves in a cemetery, you're going to know pretty much everything that's buried there. But if you have hundreds and hundreds of graves, you're probably going to say uh, most of them are just, you know, nondescript citizens. Here are the three or four things, you know, the mausoleum the players have to discover. But you could have a situation where the mere intrusion on a cemetery by living creatures causes some, you know, evil spell or, you know, the, the sanctification to cause all of the dead to rise in a zombie army whose sole purpose is to bring the intruders into the fold. And for purposes of D&D, I divide this into nobility, merchants, paupers, criminals, unknown, and mixed. And obviously you would expect the nobility to segregate themselves from the hoi polloi even in death. And you would expect grander, you know, headstones and mausoleums. And the items buried with nobility should be of, you know, greater treasure and greater value, but also the power of the sanctification of such a cemetery might be greater as well. They're going to protect themselves from grave robbers. And the size and grandeur of the you know, markers and mausoleums means that a noble graveyard would probably last longer than one, you know, for paupers or criminals. So you might say that, you know, those areas of a forgotten or ancient graveyard that have still survived the ravages of time might be, you know, typically that of nobility. You know, rich merchants are also going to have larger uh, mausoleums and whatnot. They also might have the most grandiose because they sort of have something to prove in terms of their wealth that the nobles ne don't necessarily have to. So a criminal graveyard is the classic unsanctified one I mentioned at the beginning, the medieval one, where the bodies have been, you know, mutilated or placed in such a way to denote their cursed status. But, you know, this is a perfect opportunity for some evil sect or cult to come to the cemetery, re-sanctify it by their evil god, you know, to bring back these cursed criminals or to, you know, break some curse over the treasure, something like this. You know, paupers' graveyards usually either have wooden markers or none at all. These are very easily lost to history uh, over time. But, you know, they make a really good place for people to hide treasure, right? I'm going to hide it here in grave 38 or something, come back later, and then, of course, not come back. And the unknown internees is, you know, usually something forgotten, uh, you know, some long-lost civilization or the planar travelers I mentioned. Obviously, you as the GM know who's buried. And the very large cemeteries of cities often have mixed internees, right? The nobles put themselves over here, the rich merchants there, the poor people down here, you know, in the floodplain or whatnot. <laughs> and maybe there's criminals, but maybe not. And then finally, you have, you know, oppressed groups who will often hide their dead in, you know, secret catacombs to prevent them uh, from being, you know, disturbed or desecrated by their enemies. And who is interned in a cemetery will affect, you know, what the gravestones look like. Are they, you know, elaborate mausoleums or huge granite uh, statues or, you know, simple flat gravestones, you know, wooden markers or none at all? So with large, you know, mixed graveyards, you're going to probably have one of all these kind of types. Whereas a family uh, graveyard, maybe just a mausoleum, uh, like I said, wooden markers for the servants. You know, paupers and criminal graveyards often have no markers whatsoever. But you could have a forgotten graveyard in which uh, the headstones and whatnot have been, you know, washed away or weathered. And that leads us to my final category on my template, the condition of the graveyard. And here I range from barely visible to ruined to neglected and in pristine condition. 
And here again, the other categories that I mentioned lend themselves to different variations on the conditions of the cemetery. You know, we don't expect a forgotten graveyard to be much more than either, you know, some barely visible mounds or a few scattered remnants of gravestones. But it doesn't have to be. If it is in an isolated area and there's still remnants of the sanctification, which render it immune to the ravages of time, the players might come across a forgotten cemetery and it's in pristine condition. And that's interesting. So a cemetery of recent times in which it has been abandoned, no one's been buried there for a hundred years, you would think of it as neglected. You know, the, the grass is overgrown, some of the headstones have been knocked over, but maybe not. Maybe there's a few families that have kept it going, have, you know, worked to keep it in pristine condition. And of course, we would expect a contemporary active uh, graveyard to be in pristine condition, but maybe not. Maybe there's been some kind of catastrophe, you know, earthquake, or a flood, or the desecration from some hostile group. And the final thing that I'll mention, just as a general topic, is the atmosphere of a graveyard. Now, we think of them as being a creepy place, but it kind of depends on the time of day. You know, a cemetery in the middle of the day, you know, it's kind of scary or whatever, but a cemetery at night is really scary. You know, the wind moving through the trees, uh, the gravestones either shrouded in darkness or, you know, casting weird shadows from the moonlight. And of course, location and condition influence the atmosphere. You know, a pristine cemetery in the center of a city isn't going to be as scary, you know, as a ruined cemetery at the center of a swamp. And the sanctification or lack thereof that I talked about that is essential to, you know, a graveyard in the world of D&D makes a difference in terms of how scary and creepy it is. So if you have a pristine contemporary cemetery at the center of an evil city run by an evil sect, this is going to be a creepy place for lawful good player characters to enter. So you want to think about all the factors that I talked about in my templates to then create the atmosphere for your graveyard when the players encounter it. And there you have a basic template for creating graveyards in your world. You know, just establish the type and level of sanctification that comes from the divine power that has infused the world of D&D, and then mix and match the categories that I outlined to create a unique uh, graveyard that you can use for storyline or, you know, encounter for your players. Now, don't just go for the creepy abandoned graveyard, although those can be really fun, but try to think of something different. And finally, of course, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, please leave some comments. And of course, keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.